Come gather round the campfire and hear our ghostly tales of chilling terrors, darkest woes, and anything that goes bump in the night. So cuddle up with your best friend or dare it alone. The darkness is closing in and spirits are calling your name. This is Fireside Phantoms. I'm glad we could make this happen today. Uh, I, I know. know you're a little under the weather. Yeah, it's um, it's been kind of a touch and go situation. <laughs> <laughs> well. But I got a slight cold. Um, I took my COVID test. It came back negative. Hooray. And um, yeah, it just was kind of a nasty bug that I happened to catch a summer cold. A summer cold. So I'm on the upswing now. I think I feel a lot better. So yeah, I'm ready to record. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's dive in. Okay. Do you want to go first this time or do you want sure. me to? Sure. Okay. So this episode, I'm going to share some scary stories from, again, our trip to oh, good. Portugal. Okay. Um, we we went to Barcelona, but we started our vacation flying into Lisbon, Portugal. One of our days there, we took a train just for a little day trip to Sintra, which is a town about 40 minutes from Lisbon. Okay. From there, you can take a tour bus up the winding roads of a mountaintop in Sintra, where a beautiful castle called Pena Palace sits on the site of a former monastery. The site where Pena Palace sits has a history dating back to the Middle Ages filled with tragic and paranormal stories. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah, so when you come upon this castle, it reminds you of something out of a fairy tale painted in colorful bold reds, yellows, and blues with romantic architecture, including many turrets and balconies. I really felt, you know, they, sh they should make a Lego version of this if they haven't already for kids because <laughs> the yeah. colors are perfect for the oh, block. Nice. Yeah. Anyhow, so this castle was built on the site of a medieval chapel and it was dedicated to the Virgin Mary called Our Lady of Pena. And it was said that the Virgin Mary appeared to witnesses as a full body apparition and makes the site itself very sacred. To honor the visitation of the Virgin Mary, the chapel was built on the hill and many pilgrimages were held to visit the site annually. Due to its sacred reputation, the king decided to build a monastery that was later donated to the Order of St. Jerome. The monastery, only housing 12 monks, however, seemed to incur the wrath of Mother Nature, as many natural calamities occurred after it was built. The monastery at Pena was damaged by severe lightning twice, huh. and then it was turned into rubble by the Great Lisbon Earthquake in 1755. But surprisingly, the chapel part of the monastery sustained no damage, which again was claimed a divine miracle. <laughs> Locals tell of legends that date all the way back to the Roman Empire, which claim there is great mystical powers and magnetic properties in the mountains of Sintra. The Romans used to call the area in Portugal the Mountains of the Moon. The people who lived in the area built and dedicated a temple to honor the Roman Emperor Octavian Augustus. Perhaps due to the uneasiness of the foggy atmosphere covering the top of the hills, Maybe it was the heavy, dense forest or boulders that were the size of cars littering the mountainside. Or maybe for other unknown reasons, the Romans rejected the temple. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Isn't that strange? Yeah. So instead, the people of Centra consecrated it to the moon or to Cynthia, meaning goddess of the moon. And eventually the area became Centra. In 1838. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Centra. I've heard that that name before. I want to say, is it a Game of Thrones? <laughs> That's what it sounds like. And it's also um, synonymous with meaning uh, bright light. Okay. Too. So, you know, you could have heard it used in a different text like that, you know, so... Yeah, it totally reminds me of something yeah, out of a I'm fantasy picturing. novel yeah. for There's sure. There's dragons flying around. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> in, in 1838, King Consort Ferdinand II bought the chapel and employed several engineers and architects to replace the monastery ruins into a summer palace for the royal family, which was completed by 1854. I don't know if they were superstitious, but it was said that the royal family only lived on the side of the palace, which was not included in the original monastery foundations. 
The architecture included decor of stone serpents, a lion's head, ornate balconies, and Moorish or Islamic design of towers covered in golden paint. And Count Dracula sitting at the balcony, bowing at the moon. (laughs) There is a huge clock tower on the castle, which features a sundial and a platform for a cannon that is shot off every day at noon. King Ludwig II was inspired by the Painted Palace design, which he used as inspiration in the construction of the famous Neuschwanstein Castle in Germany. Nice pronunciation. Thank you. Which later was the model used for the design of Cinderella's Castle in Disneyland. It was said that King Ferdinand wanted Painted Palace to resemble an opera. Composer Richard Strauss, after visiting the castle, said... Today is the happiest day of my life. Sintra is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. This is a true garden of Klingzor, and there up above is the castle of the Holy Grail. Wow. Oh, okay. Could you imagine yeah. how he would court women back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> Wowzers. Yeah, you want to go see the uh, the Holy Grail? Come yeah. with me. <laughs> Come with me. Your face is like the shining dew of a morning rose I want when it opens to drink its your buds blood. <laughs> to the beautiful light of the dawn. <laughs> So this castle, though, has a very unsettling feature of a great monster-like gargoyle which greets visitors as they enter the gateway of the palace. It is supposed to be a representation of Triton as a half-fish, half-man monster who is sitting in a conch shell holding up the upper wall of the palace. Crafted out of limestone, it is surrounded by a coral reef design. The design might have been inspired by old merman sightings in the area. One story was told that the sea god Triton lived in an area close to Adraga Beach located on the western side of Sintra. Written by Pliny the Elder in 27 to 79 AD, he states that a merman was seen playing a conch shell in the area. Another sighting recorded in 1554 by Damia de Gua, who was an important Portuguese humanist, philosopher, and close friend and student of Erasmus, states that in the area near Sintra, there is a rock overlooking the sea and a cave that ushers in water and vomits it all out again. The people who live in the area have seen a merman who is singing with his shell. So the same thing, singing with a shell. Yeah, two stories back that Mm -hmm. up. He goes on to explain that, quote, in the ancient archives of the kingdom, there is an old manuscript which has a contract stating there was a tax issued on the capturing of mermaids, mermans, and other sea species on the beaches of Portugal, end quote. Demia de Gua also theorized that the mermans or sea creatures were attracted to the fruit, which is abundant along the shore in that area of Sintra. Sometimes it was rumored they were caught and taught a more civilized way of life integrating and eventually being accepted into society. So I guess, Holly, the rumor of acquiring sea legs on land is true for some of these mermen. So they capture these mermen mm-hmm. and they bring them on, or more men, and, ca- and bring them on to shore. Mm-hmm. And eventually their fishtails fall away and they have human legs. Something. It's weird. Or maybe... Um, Maybe they didn't really have fish tails. Maybe they were covered in like scales, but still had human legs. Hmm. So I don't know how they acquired their sea legs, but I think it's interesting because how could you hide a fish tail and integrate into society? Very difficult. Yeah, it would be hard. And then if you can get into the water, can't you just swim away? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know. Hmm. Very strange. Yeah. Citizens and visitors to the area claim that phone batteries drain more quickly, there are problems with quality of photos taken from cameras in the area, and light bulbs will shatter with no explanation. We did notice and commented on how all of our phones were having trouble keeping charged, but that probably was due to us using directions on our phone the whole time. Yeah. Because that drains the battery pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. The mountainous area of Sintra was also home to the Knights Templar and the meeting place of other secret organizations, such as the Rosicrucians and the Masons. Just down the hill from Pena Palace is another amazing castle called La Quintas de Regalias, 
a residence belonging to a former Brazilian who was at the time said to be the richest man to live in Portugal, called Antonio Augusto Carvalho Monteiro. Yes, and just like in Princess Bride, he has come to kill your father. <laughs> Prepare to die. <laughs> it is said Antonio Augusto Carvalho Monteiro inherited a large fortune through marriage and was a collector of rare artifacts, a lover of poetry, and an entomologist, which, if you don't know, is someone who studies insects. Upon looking at the property, it looks like somewhere definitely a vampire would live. Yeah, for sure. Despite it being built in 1910, the design makes it look ancient, as it is very gray, gothic, and unsettling. The property is surrounded by acres of gardens, and it is rumored that Montiero would use it to initiate candidates into the secret order of the Masons, or perhaps another secret society. There are all sorts of symbols regarding the Knights Templar, Christianity, Greek, and pagan gods, as well as references to alchemy and the tarot. La Quinta de Regalia was built in levels up the side of the mountain, each representing a level of enlightenment. Montiero was reported to be an initiate himself, and it is rumored he was a collector of items that could bring him supernatural qualities, or at least in communication with the divine. Other historians felt he was just interested in the commonalities of all religions and wanted to create a sacred habitat for him and his family that represented his philosophies. It was also claimed that sculpture artist Deo Ray, who purchased the property after him, was curiously also a mason. Now, masonry does not require belief in any specific religion to join the order. And no, Holly, they've not paid me to mention this in our episode, even though new recruits for the society are at an all-time low. Maybe we should um, apply. <laughs> Maybe. But in Portugal, many Masons were Christians. And that is why some think there are many references to Christianity on the property. Among the statues of Greek gods along a promenade in the gardens, there are gargoyles and winding paths that lead to beautiful fountains and benches. One strange feature on the property is the inverted tower or the initiation well, whose entrance is disguised by gigantic boulders. The well was never designed to hold water and never functioned as a well. It descends 98 feet deep, representing the descent into darkness and can also represent the nine levels of hell according to Dante's Divine Comedy. Many believe candidates for the order were blindfolded, made to carry a sword across the chest, and then forced to descend on their own down the nine circular levels of stairs to the bottom of the well where a diagram of an eight-pointed star with a Templar cross in the inner circle of the star is found. The points of the star each lead to separate underground passageways, where the initiate would then have to find the correct underground tunnel to lead him out of the darkness into the light. Hmm. One of the paths leads out to a pond of stepping stones, which figuratively represents Christ's miracle of walking on water, across and under a waterfall. Another path will reach the two chapels on the property, which are positioned below and above one another. It is thought once the initiate reaches the chapel, they are then met by the other members of the Brotherhood and accepted into the order. The bottom chapel is also part of a crypt. Well, you know, that is for all the poor chaps who stumbled on the stairs and, well, ascended into the light without the rest of the fuss and gallantry. <laughs> <laughs> it has a Masonic black and white checkered floor and an altar with a red Templar flag on top. In the upper chapel, the altar has what seems to be the resurrected Jesus, but also has pentagrams which adorn above and to either side of the altar. There, oh. are all, yeah, there are also more Masonic and Templar symbols on the floor of this church. And a side note to ponder, the Knights Templars never depicted Jesus dying on the cross. In fact, some legends think they never believed Jesus was crucified. During the persecution of the Templars, the King of Portugal asked the Pope if he could create a new order of military protection and call it the Order of the Christ. He was granted permission, and so he just rebranded the Portuguese Templars and saved many other Templars seeking asylum. It is suspected that the Templars might have also kept their hidden treasure in the hills of Sintra. Huh. 
visitors are allowed to descend the steps into the well and navigate the gardens, exploring the caves and passageways. Were you able to walk on water while you were there? We, yeah. So we, um, I don't know if I walked on water, but I saw where the stones were coming out of the tunnel and we did descend down into the well. How was so that? So that was, it was a little um, scary. Yeah. yeah. A little scary. I couldn't imagine doing it blindfolded and at night. No. Because you'd look down and it'd be kind of terrifying, but. Like the ring. Kind of like the ring. That yes. creepy girl is going to crawl up and get yes. you. Yes. Yeah. And it was covered with moss. So it just felt very well-like. Right, right. Or hell-like, yeah. depending. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. So it was it was really interesting. The gardens were absolutely beautiful. Many stories and legends claim there were real human sacrifices taking place on the property. Oh, shit. And local people have heard screaming and other beastly noises coming from the grounds in the late night hours. There are also stories of ghostly figures seen at night crossing the balconies of the palace. Of course, with the looks of the place... You can also imagine that the idea of vampires living there would be a common rumor. Sure. In fact, there were suspicions surrounding the sudden death of Montiero, who died on the property in 1920, just a short 10 years after seeing the completion of his great work. I could not find the reason of his death listed. Some people feel he was murdered to obtain his rare collection of over 30,000 books or his rare and expensive artifacts. The Library of Congress claims they acquired his collection of books, but researchers say it is strange that there was no acquisition list made for them. They are just said to be randomly scattered among the library's general collections. There have been attempts by historians to find them, but as of today, only 9,000 of the 30,000 rare books have been identified and confirmed as part of Montiero's collection. One item that was highly regarded and owned by Montiero was a rare pocket watch called the Leroy 01, which was displayed at the Paris World Fair in 1900. It is supposed to be the most complicated clock ever made. Huh. And I wonder if it's a time travel clock. <laughs> <laughs> I always think about things like, you know, from uh -huh. movies and stuff. Yeah. Some critics of Montiero believe he was obsessed with finding immortality. The strange burial requests only added fuel to the vampire legends. Yes. Montiero commissioned the builder of his castle to also construct his tomb in Lisbon. The tomb was built to resemble the size and shape of a Masonic temple with specific instructions for it to face east and adorned with specific symbols. A door knocker has a bee carrying a skull and there are owls and poppies which symbolize wisdom and deep sleep. I say, quote, deep sleep. <laughs> the key which opens the castle, Quintus de Regalias, in Sintra, also unlocks his second residence in Lisbon, and Holly yeah. also opens his tomb. Ew. But even more freaky, Montiero was buried with a spare key. Oh, really? Yeah. So I think Montiero was planning to visit his homes again, regardless Did of being dead and buried. After the death of Montiero, the next owner of the property in 1942 was sculpture artist Voldemar de Oray. That sounds like a vampire name. A.K.A. Voldemar. <laughs> yeah, Hello. right. Hello. Harry Potter. Yeah, that's a gigantic red flag. People. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Lock and load. Yep. The family used it as their private residence until it sold hands to a Japanese company. And eventually the property was designated a historical site and opened up to the public in 1998. However, when we toured the actual mansion, we only saw a very small part. Much of the residence was blocked off from public access. Huh. Suspicious. Well, that's where he sleeps in his yeah. coffin. That's, so he probably doesn't yeah. want anyone in there. I mean, at the very least, let us investigate the basement. Yeah. Hello. That's yeah. where all vampires live. Of course. So that was a little bit disappointing, but the gardens alone are worth the visit. It's amazing. I could not find any substantial proof that Montiero was anything other than a naturalist having an eccentric fascination for symbology, religious ideologies, literature, artifacts, and of course, bugs. He also was credited for helping with the founding of the Lisbon Zoo and was an honorary president in 1917. But he definitely was an eccentric person. And I can't help but think of that Dracula character portrayed in the Penny Dreadful series on Showtime, who was a zoologist 
a naturalist, and who also liked creepy crawlers. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Montiero gave them some inspiration for the character. I did feel when we visited that the whole area of Centra had an otherworldly feel with its winding roads and lush greenery, forests, and beauty. I can see how people would associate the supernatural with it. But the scariest experience for me was the bus ride flying around the narrow streets and the hairpin curves <laughs> of the mountain. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'll be sure to include some pictures of our tour to Centra on Instagram. Cool. What do you so, have for us today? Well, I'm going to try to get through this yes. without my cat interrupting because she's, you know, trying to get my attention here. Um, I'm actually doing the Mercer Williams house. It's, uh, I'll get into it here and you're probably going to recognize a little bit about it because it's kind of well known. The Mercer Williams house is a 7,000 square foot mansion that sits on the corner of Monterey Square in the heart of Savannah, Georgia. It was designed by John S. Norris, a New York architect who built many buildings in and around Savannah. The Mercer Williams home was originally started for General Hugh Whedon Mercer in 1860, but construction stopped when General Mercer left Savannah to join the Confederate Army during the Civil War. After the war, he returned to Savannah, but ultimately decided to sell the unfinished home to John R. Wilder, and after that, Mercer moved to Baltimore. John R. Wilder was a doctor who completed the home's construction in 1868. So even though it is called the Mercer Williams House, no member of the Mercer family ever actually lived in the home. Now, the story goes that Dr. Wilder lived in the house with his wife for many years. Then one day in 1902, Dr. Wilder woke up and decided he had had enough of his wife. So he took a pillow and put it over her face, smothering her to death. Oh, my goodness. Later that day, he too was found dead after falling off a balcony in the home. Now, I didn't find any information about these deaths other than a Savannah Ghost Tour video I found on YouTube. So my guess is this story is made up for the tourists. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that I don't know that Dr. Wilder actually killed his wife and then died in the home because I don't see any other evidence of that other than this one tourist video. Yeah. So. After the Wilders, the home was used by the Savannah Shriners Alley Temple until they finished use of it, and it sat vacant for 10 years. During its vacancy, an 11-year-old boy named Tommy Downs went into the home, apparently to hunt pigeons. While at the home, Tommy either fell from the roof of the home or the top floor balcony. Unfortunately, when he fell, he impaled his head on the wrought iron fence that surrounds oh the perimeter of the home. Oh yeah, my gosh, it's pretty bad. This is awful. Uh, this is uh, true. I did find lots of information about this death. Paramedics tried to save him, and they cut the spikes from the fence that pierced his skull, but Tommy Downs did not survive. Those missing spikes were never replaced, and ghost tours like to point them out at the spot where Tommy Downs died. Now, there is much speculation about how Tommy died. Some say Tommy's death was just an accidental fall, while others say that the Mercer Williams home is evil and that something inside the home pushed Tommy to his death. We will really never know the truth. Then, in 1969, Jim Williams moved into the home. This is where the Mercer Williams home gets the second part of its name. Jim Williams was a historian, antique dealer, and preservationist who specialized in renovating older homes. It took him two years, but Jim was able to fully renovate the Mercer Williams home to its original glory. He ultimately decided to make it his permanent residence and use the carriage house on the back of the property for his antique and restoration business. Jim Williams also had a notorious reputation for throwing lavish parties, with his annual Christmas party being the invite everyone in town wanted to receive. During one of his parties, Jim met 21-year-old Danny Hansford. The two got to know each other quite well and started an intimate relationship. Unfortunately, sometimes with passion comes pain, and the two fought quite often. Danny would try to make a scene at Jim's parties and would be angry and demand money and alcohol from Jim, perhaps as blackmail to keep him quiet about their homosexual relationship. However, on May 2, 1981, Jim's partying days and the relationship with his lover came to a screeching end. Danny and Jim got into a heated argument inside the Mercer Williams home sometime in the wee hours of the morning. Jim claims that Danny pushed over an antique grandfather clock in his rage and then pulled out a gun and pointed it at Jim. 
When Danny went to pull the trigger, the gun jammed, giving Jim a chance to pull out his own gun from his desk and shoot Danny. Jim claimed it was in self-defense, but he called the police half an hour later to report what happened, which resulted in his arrest for the murder of Danny Hansford. Prosecutors believe that the murder was intentional and that the 30-minute lapse of time between the murder and when Jim called the police was used to stage the scene to make it look like a self-defense shooting. The trial resulted in Jim being found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Mm. However, the trial was thrown out due to conflicting police reports of the incident. The second trial in 1983 also resulted in a guilty verdict and life sentence, but it too was thrown out when Georgia's Supreme Court decided that the sheriff could not be allowed to testify as an expert witness. The third trial in 1987 resulted in 11 members of the jury voting guilty with one person voting not guilty, which created a hung jury. Finally, in 1989, the trial was moved to Augusta and resulted in Jim Williams' acquittal. This jury only deliberated for one hour. It wasn't clear why three out of four juries would find Jim Williams guilty and the last one would decide he was innocent. But what is known is that Jim was friends with a root doctor named Valerie Bowles. A root doctor is someone who uses herbs, potions, and spells to influence people and events. I'm glad you clarified that. Yeah. Because with your cold, I thought you were saying rude doctor. I'm like, <laughs> yes. No, His root. bedside manner was not a <laughs> so good one. Rude. Yeah, so rude. Root, rude. Uh, root. R-O-O-T. I had to look it up because I never heard that term before. No. But it's basically kind of like a witch doctor, it sounds like. Yeah. Valerie performs spells on behalf of Jim Williams to help garner him a successful outcome come to his trials and if you think about it when you're tried four times and three of them you're found guilty and the last one you're acquitted she's doing something right my god because (laughs) every time you get convicted it gets overturned on a technicality of some kind you have to go through it again and oh lo and behold the last the third one was a hung jury because one person on the jury decided not guilty Thanks, Root Doctor, for helping him get out of, you know, uh, going to prison for the rest of his life. So when Jim was finally freed, he returned to the Mercer Williams home and started planning his next big Christmas party. Six months after his acquittal, Jim was found dead on January 14th, 1990 from heart failure. Uh Uh-oh. He collapsed right beside the spot where his former lover, Danny Hansford, had died from his gunshot wounds. Whoa, Mm -hmm. that's coincidental. Isn't that interesting? In 1994, the book Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Barrent was released. The book explored the story of Jim Williams and the murder of Danny Hansford. The book's author had befriended Jim Williams after Jim had been convicted of the murder the first time and had been released on appeal. The novel was ultimately nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 1985 and was turned into a movie by Clint Eastwood in 1997 starring Kevin Spacey, John Cusack, and Jude Law. So Kevin Spacey played Jim Williams, uh, Jude Law played Danny Hansford, and Johnny Cusack uh, was the writer who had put himself into the story. With all the strange occurrences at the Mercer Williams house, you can be assured that ghost stories abound. First off is the rumor that the house itself was built atop the unmarked graves of those who died of yellow fever in the 1800s, giving it an already troubled haunted lore. Many tourists have claimed to see the ghosts of poor Tommy Downs either peering at them from the windows of the house or on top of the balcony or rooftop. Some even claim to have seen Tommy falling from the house onto the wrought iron fence below over and over again. The horrific event recorded onto the energy of the house. You know, they say sometimes traumatic uh, events will will Mm -hmm. burn onto the energy of a place. It is said that several tourists have caught pictures of the ghost of Tommy Downs on their cameras, but upon looking, I couldn't find any on the internet. So their rumor is that there are pictures out there of Tommy Downs on people's film. Yeah. If anybody out there knows of where we can find those pictures, I I would be very interested in seeing them because I know there's probably a ton of ghost hunters out there that try and capture evidence around absolutely the property. If you think about savannah mm-hmm. it's gonna be loaded completely with ghosts, haunted totally haunted yeah in fact that's one place i wouldn't mind visiting yeah i think that would be a really cool town to go see same but just yeah. for the history alone really mm-hmm. uh those that venture inside the home have heard disembodied voices footsteps and have seen apparitions and have felt watched by invisible eyes the apparition of jim williams has been spotted in the home more than once 
He has been seen walking up and down the hallways or inside the study where he died. Some even claim that before his death, he was being tortured by the ghost of Danny Hansford and that perhaps his quote-unquote heart attack was just Jim dying from fright. Of course, Danny Hansford's ghost is still present and has been seen mostly in the study, but sometimes the hallways too. Apparently, he is still pissed off about his murder. Visitors can feel his angry presence the moment they step inside the home. Savannah locals claim that around Christmas time, if you walk past the house at just the right time, you will think there was a major Christmas party happening in there. Oh, I you, bet. Yeah. You will see guests dressed up in their finest clothes, music playing, the home lit up, and laughter drifting through the air. When the police arrive to investigate who is throwing a party at the home, it's all quiet and dark. That's what I would do. If I had a chance to go there, I would throw a big party yeah, and right? see if the ghosts are attracted and, and come Show join. up. Yeah, because yeah. they loved parties. Yeah. Presently, the Mercer Williams house is open to the public as a museum. Jim Williams' sister, Dr. Dorothy Kinjury, is the owner of the property. She is not a fan of the ghost stories and does not encourage the rumors about the house. Oh, poo you. <laughs> she is also not a big fan of the book, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Perhaps Poo on you again. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps she does not like the way her brother is portrayed. Regardless, if you find yourself in Savannah, Georgia, this is definitely one house to look up, not just for the ghost stories, but to take in its elegant beauty and to appreciate the restoration that Jim Williams created. And that is the Mercer Williams house. I love that story. It's an interesting story. You know, there's murder and intrigue and mm -hmm. it's got kind of a dark history with the death of Tommy Downs and the way he yeah. died is terrible. And, and the spells for his Yeah, uh, and the spells the, the root doctor that helped him kind of beat his rap there. Yeah, a lot and of stuff. There was a quote from one of the judges. I, I didn't put it in my story. He had been the presiding judge over three of the trials and he said... Jim Williams is guilty as hell. <laughs> he goes, but Danny Hansford was a total troublemaker too. So almost like, yeah, he probably murdered him, but maybe, he deserved it. But maybe he needed to. Oh no, <laughs> it was kind of a weird, <laughs> kind of a weird uh, quote from a judge. But you know, um, it just sounded like Danny Hansford had a very troubled past and yeah. was a very unstable person. I'm not justifying what Jim Williams did, of course, but, um, you know, they had a very uh, uh, passionate and angry relationship mm -hmm. that sometimes, you know, results in a murder. <laughs> yeah, add alcohol. Yeah. Add, you never yeah, know. Anyway, there it's you go. It's a good story. By the way, as a segue, have you seen Disney's Haunted Mansion yet? I have not. The movie? No. I went and saw that with a friend, and it was actually really good. Was Woody it? Woody Harrelson's in it. Oh. Some big names. Jamie Curtis. Oh, really? Jamie oh, Lee Curtis. Oh, I love Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, yeah. Danny DeVito's in it. Wow. Um, huh. Yeah, a lot of actors and actresses are in it, and they do a really good job. That's I great. really enjoyed it. I especially loved... You see every aspect of the actual, what it looks like in the Haunted Mansion of Disneyland. So oh. people who can't go or go visit that attraction can kind of live vicariously through the movie. And I won't oh. spoil it for anyone, but it really was a refreshing movie, a family movie that, um, yeah, I think did a really good job with comedy too. Oh, good. Also. So they go through all the different rooms of the house mm -hmm. and stuff. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's oh, fun. Fig. Yeah, it's <laughs> Sorry, fun. Carol. Hi, Fig. Oh, Fig's just, going for another pass she, at the breast. Yeah, she, she's trying to grab <laughs> up Carol again. <laughs> I should get a picture I, of that. I know. Please don't. <laughs> anyway, guys, <laughs> we'll see you us. next week. And uh, everyone send out good thoughts to have Holly <laughs> back with us and heal. Yeah, that's right. Thanks. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. I'm going to say that over again because I didn't say the word ruins, correct? Oh, okay. I didn't I have, notice. I have an issue with that word. Is this I like say, museum? Yeah. I don't know how to say it. <laughs> okay, go okay, for it. Okay, back up. Take two. Chico. Maybe, uh, Figgy, get down. She, You can just knock her down off the table. Oh, I'm not going to knock down your kitty cat. Hello. Yeah, Fig. She just wants attention because ah! we're not. Oh, okay. okay. Darn it. Okay. <laughs> she kind of felt you up there <laughs> a little <all> right. bit. <laughs> Across. Let me say that again. One of the paths. Sorry, go ahead. Pause for coughing.
Fig, stop that. Fig is quite the she's nuisance needy. today. She's needy for some yeah, attention, I guess. Something. Yeah. But typically, vampires aren't really interested in vegetables, so. Sorry, pause. Oh, gosh. Poor oh, Holly. Sorry, Josh. Of course, Danny Hanford's gross. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Sorry, girl. <laughs> it's okay. You're doing uh, well. Okay. <laughs> So, of course, Danny Hansford's ghost is still present, and he has been mostly... No. As the flames die down, do remain undaunted. Though all hitchhikers are ghosts, and all dolls are definitely haunted. Hey, guys. Be sure to follow us on Instagram. Our handle is at Fireside Phantoms. If you have a spooky story you would like to share with us, send it to firesidephantoms at gmail.com and you may hear it on a future episode.